Welcome to Dose of Support, a podcast for healthcare professionals to preserve stories and provide a dose of support to each other through community and shared experiences. We're going to share successful and sometimes not successful self-care methods. And I'm your host, Dr. Vanessa Casper, a nurse practitioner and a professional just like you. Remember, I'm hosting this podcast, but I'm not your healthcare provider, and my guests aren't here to provide healthcare advice either. But we do encourage you to seek out care from your own healthcare professional. And although we're sharing stories from healthcare, I intend to fully adhere to HIPAA and protect privacy. And remember, this podcast is not related to any employer. It's hard out there, so let's find some self-care in healthcare. Stay tuned, everyone. Well, hey there, listeners. Welcome back to Dose of Support. You've reached the spot in our show where we do a huddle, so let's check in with each other. I had a lovely weekend last weekend. I know some of you saw my brunch post on Facebook, of course, socially distanced, and I enjoyed the very hot weather that we had, and I've been trotting through this week getting ready because this weekend is my five-year wedding anniversary, so... We are actually going out of town this weekend and taking a little trip, and so I'm really excited. It'll be socially distanced, and I will definitely post some pictures, Um, and I can't believe it's been five years. We've actually known each other for 10 years, but we've been married for five, and so that's really exciting. And then I am looking forward to this week's guest because I think a lot of people undervalue chiropractic care. And it's funny because a lot of patients use chiropractors. A lot of people believe in chiropractic care. And you might be listening and thinking, yeah, I'm one of those people. And certainly, if you go to a very well-trained chiropractor, you can achieve wellness. And so I want everyone to go into this episode with an open mind, an accepting attitude, and really embrace uh, what Dr. Annie has to say and really recognize chiropractic work as part of healthcare because it really is. So I hope you enjoy learning in this episode and stay tuned for more. Hi listeners, welcome back to the show. Today, Dr. Annie Bayedo shares the many detours along her journey to become a doctor of chiropractic care. She shares a story about how fate brought her to work with people who need acute musculoskeletal care and also in preventative care and wellness. Welcome, Dr. Annie. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Vanessa. (laughs) Um, Well, so you are a chiropractor, and we haven't had a chiropractor on the show yet. And do you want to tell the listeners just a little bit about um, the training that it takes to become a chiropractor? Absolutely. I would love to. And I'm honored to be here and be the first chiropractor, um, first of many, I hope. Um, So chiropractic school um, is a little bit over three years. It's quite intense. We get 10 trimesters total in length. So it's uh, 10 trimesters with two week breaks in between. So there's like, like no big summer breaks and it's kind of go, go, go. And you kind of get through all the classes and we range topics, um, from anatomy to, of course, neurology is a huge part of our training, pathology, immunology. We study extensively in radiology, um, definitely have some training in nutrition. And of course the actual adjustments themselves, starts from pretty much day one. They kind of throw you in there and hope you swim or drown, sort of. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is it a competitive process to enter into a program? It can be. Um, I went to Northwestern Health Science University, which is in right here in Minnesota in Bloomington. Um, there are, uh, as far as I know, a handful of other schools uh, around the country as well as all around the world. Um, you do have to have a certain um, number of prerequisite courses, and most of us have under degrees and undergraduate degrees in biology or kinesiology, you know, physiology. 
Um, I was probably one of the odd, odd ducks out having a background in art and marketing, but um, it took a lot of work to kind of get to where I, where I am. So, What kind of training hours with hands-on, like clinical hours, are included in a program like that? So we are required to do a whole year community-based internship where we do a lot of actual hands-on um, out in the real world, so to speak. Um, and that, in fact, is where I met my mentor. And now um, I work for her at Sunu Wellness, um, founder of Sunu, Dr. Susan. Um, as far as in school, like I said, the training starts day one. Um, we have a course called Methods Class that kind of follows us throughout the three years of chiropractic school. And almost every single day we practice on each other and hone in our skills. So it's a long and uh, hard process, that was for sure. So the typical chiropractor student would probably have an undergraduate degree and then complete three more years of intensive training. And I'm guessing that most of that is quite supervised. And then um, once you graduate from school, can you just start practicing or do you have to take a test or how does that work? Yes, great question. We actually have four rounds of board exams throughout the three years of school. Um, Three rounds of the board exams are all written and the last round is a practical where you do all the hands-on things. Um, And again, very grueling. And um, I certainly do not miss those years in school. Um, Yeah, so you're not going to sign up to do that again? Probably not voluntarily, no. (laughs) No, Definitely not. Okay, so you complete the fourth round of exams while you are still in school then? Most of us do. Correct. Okay. And so then you graduate and what do you do next? Do you need to have a residency type situation where you complete hours under a supervisor or what happens next? Can you just open your own practice? Um, Certainly some people do. So within the three years of training or schooling that we go through, the last year is the hands-on portion um, of residency, so to speak. Um, And after that, some people do open their own. I chose to be in a group practice where there's multiple other doctors on staff, um, which is a very healthy and collaborative environment. Um, And it just kind of suits my needs and my personality. Okay. So you have, it sounds like a lot of support as you're, as, as you kind of learn and grow as a chiropractor. Um, what does the average day in the life of a chiropractor look like? What does the work look like? Sure. So we're in COVID times right now. What the average day is probably not incredibly average. Um, but it really depends on what type of patients I'm seeing that day. If I'm seeing a new patient, usually the exam takes a long time. We do a very extensive um health exam on the patient on their first visit. We go through posture analysis. We go through any sort of red flags that might prevent us from actually doing the adjustment with them that day. We talk about their family history, health history, um, lifestyle choices, um, their health goals, of course, is a big part of it. Um, And then we do, most of the time, we do the uh, actual adjustment. And then, of course, there's my least favorite part of the day, which is charting, but equally important. (laughs) We can all relate to that. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. But for your listeners. um, How many patients per day do you see? Like, I think there are some chiropractic clinics that are like, turn them and burn them. See a bunch of people. How many does Sunu Wellness see? So right now, given the, again, the special circumstances of COVID, we are scheduling patients every half an hour or so, just so we can really space the visits out so that there is no overlap in our lobby space for um, excessive interaction between people. And there's plenty of time for each practitioner 
and our support staff to clean the rooms very thoroughly in between each patient. Um, usually the adjustments are 15 minutes long, um, but right now, I, like I said, it's about half an hour. And typically, for me personally, I'm doing half days right now um, since I have a little one at home. Um, I usually see anywhere about 10 to 15 people a day. Okay. So that gives me an idea of your caseload. That's good. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, clearly there are, I'm just thinking historically, chiropractic care has a lot of stigma attached to it. And historically, insurance has not covered this type of care. And we are seeing that people are understanding what you do more, what you can offer, and insurances are now starting to cover the care that you give. And can you speak to the stigma around that and the historical references around that? Um, certainly, I can try to speak as far as my knowledge goes. Um, we do accept insurance in our clinic. I know a lot of uh, colleagues who choose to not do that and have a strictly cash-based um, practice. And the reason why we choose insurance is that we believe that we can serve more people and giving, given the current, as you say, um, insurance climate, there are some coverages. We do a lot of patient education surrounding insurance coverage and what that means. Um, just because it says unlimited visits doesn't necessarily mean unnecess uh, unlimited visits. Um, what they usually mean by that is acute care is unlimited, meaning if you have a new injury, you can come in and usually they'll give you, you know, 10 to 15 visits to cover your current condition. But any sort of preventative care, wellness care, it are, those are not covered by insurance. So we tell patients that upfront so that they have an expectation of how many visits to expect that are covered by insurance and how many visits if they choose to go on a wellness plan um, and what that would look like financially for them. What a shame that we have such a reactionary society where we don't want to just prevent the problems and get ahead of them. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. And uh, we would rather have costly fixes after right. the fact. Right. It is. Really <laughs> yeah. Um, luckily, most of our patients are very understanding of, you know, what their policy means and what that means for us as practitioners too. So many do choose to stay on as wellness patients after and prevent further and repeated patterns of injury, um, which, you know, they themselves see the benefit firsthand. So it's easy to continue care because of that. But certainly it's a little bit of an uphill battle. And I'm grateful that at SUNY Wellness, we actually have an insurance specialist who does all of that billing and all the things for us because I would just be totally lost in that world. Yeah, me too. I am I am so lost when it comes to insurance. And like, let's be honest, we all fucking hate it. Like, right. we shouldn't have to jump through hoops. Patients shouldn't have to jump through hoops to get the care that they need or the care that they want. Like, mm -hmm. if they want to prevent something, mm -hmm. let's let that. I just don't understand. I mean, we're just good people. That's why we give a shit. It's, um, <laughs> that's why we're in it, so, right? We're compassionate. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so what, wh why do you think you chose to be a chiropractor? Let's go way back. Like how one day you were like, I need to crack people for a living. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so I actually studied art. That was, uh, one of my great passions in life. I've actually always thought about going to medical school and becoming a pediatrician. That was the other path that I almost took. Um, I never really knew what chiropractic was, to be honest. Um, I never, I never went to one. I grew up with traditional Chinese medicine. To give you a little bit of a background there, can uh, you explain that a little bit more? Like, like why did you grow up with that? I didn't grow up with that, and I. Yeah you know, grew up in Minnesota. <laughs> right. So my background, I am Chinese. Um, I still speak Chinese. My mom lives here in the States with us. 
Um, I grew up in China until I was about 10, and then we moved here, and the rest is history, as they say. But Chinese traditional Chinese medicine has always been part of our family culture, I guess you could say. So the approach is always a little bit more wellness versus disease focused. Um, it's about fine tuning the body. It's about getting ahead of, you know, it's about boosting your immune system. We used to make my, fun of my mom all the time for always lecturing us about our immune system and Long and behold, now I'm lecturing my patients about their immune system. So like <laughs> it's come full circle. circle <laughs> every single time. So let's back up for a second. In China, traditional Chinese medicine is the norm for care. Is that correct? Like there is a blend of Western and Eastern medicine yes, there? That's correct. It's the very much 50-50. Um, okay. In the hospital system in China, you have the surgical unit. But, you know, or the traditional Western medical unit, and then you have the traditional Chinese medicine units, and oftentimes they collaborate. Oftentimes acupuncture is used across the board. It's just a very fluid sort of process there. Awesome. Um, yes. Yes. So you brought that with you as part of your background, and you immigrated with your family, and... So you always kind of had this as as part of who you are. And but then you're like I'm I'm going to go do art. <laughs> yes. Well, you know when you're in your 20s and uh I had the uh luck to get to study at NYU for a summer where I was exposed to all kinds of amazing art at the Met and the Frick collection and you know just all the amazing things. So halfway through my freshman year I kind of said I'm going to be an art historian or an art dealer or something in art. That's what I want to do. So as you can imagine, to much of my parents' dismay, <laughs> we, uh, you know, I sort of took on this art history and actually went on to go to New York and had my master's degree in art business uh, before returning to Minnesota and working for the Walker Art Center for a while before realizing that medicine still calls for me and there's just something about healthcare that is still just so attractive to me. And so that's where I started the process of going back to the U of M um, as a matter of fact, and took all the prerequisite courses in preparation for med school, took the MCAT, the whole thing. And in the midst of this, in, in all the middle of this, I met the love of my life, my husband, he introduced me to his family one Christmas, and his brother and his sister-in-law are both chiropractors. They're incredible doctors. Oh, what are the chances? Right. right. So they spoke with so much passion about chiropractic and the people that they get to help and just the difference they made in people's lives. And I just had never heard of such a thing. So I just started looking into it. And the more I learn about it, the more of that you know, holistic health that I grew up with kind of came into play and it just made total sense for me to pursue this. Um, plus I've always been a very hands-on person. So this was kind of a perfect fit. <laughs> yeah. More so than, than what being a physician would probably be like. I mean, we, we still need to interview a physician on the show and I'm totally open to that. Um, but the job is very different and this, this role is really different. And I feel like, um, it's really nice that you had people in your life that you could bounce questions, like career questions off of. I, I don't think yeah. a lot of people have that. Like somehow people find their way into the roles that they land in, but it's really nice to have that support system to be like, am I doing the right thing? Absolutely. It's been one of my greatest fortunes in life is to have an incredible family support and almost everything I've wanted to pursue and chiropractic is no different and it's really been incredible to like you said to be able to call my brother-in-law or sister on and just say is this the right move for me should I go for it what do you think and you know and they've been in practice for decades more than I have and so they are incredible resources for me for sure so what is the best part about being a chiropractor oh that is a great question I I guess I come from a place where I see pain 
all day long, right? That's why people come in see me at least the first few visits. It's because they are in pain. And pain can be so debilitating and exhausting, both physically and mentally. And to be able to touch somebody's life in such a profound way as to decrease the amount of pain that they feel is really an honor and a privilege that I don't take lightly. Um, it's been amazing, again, to practice in this group setting where I have four other doctors to, to ask questions. Between the five of us, there's 20 years of experience in practice. And so if I'm not seeing the results that I want from a patient, I can kind of set my ego aside and say, what is the best course for this patient? Do I need to refer them to PT? Um, is there some sort of un underlying internal issue? Do we need to you know, do a referral to an MD or a specialist? Or should acupuncture be added? I love the flexibility that this has um, for everyone, this and meaning chiropractic has for everyone, is that this is only the beginning of your health journey, and we're all figuring out together. And it's a highly tailored and specific process for each person, depending on what they need. So it's not, you know, kind of a blanket treatment plan for everybody. This might be a little like deep, but do you feel that people come to you wanting a quick fix? Like they've tried everything else, nothing's working, they come to you, they just want it to be fixed. And because I see this a lot in my gig, I see a lot of people that they just want to go back home and do what they were doing. They don't want to make a lifestyle change or they don't want to, you know, and, and so people don't take ownership sometimes. And, and that's not always their fault. Some people just don't have the education to take care of themselves. Some people don't have the means to take care of themselves, but some people do have those things and they're just looking to you to fix it. You know, that's a hundred percent. I a hundred percent agree with you on that. I do get a fair number of those people. But a large part of my job is also education. And what that entails is even if you don't have the financial means to you know, go and buy organic vegetables, what you can do starting today is drink more water. You'll be surprised by how just being well hydrated, <laughs> that could make a difference in your body. Or you know these kind of stretches I can offer you, just do them throughout the day. And come back to me next week and tell me how you feel. I think when you lay out plans that are a little bit simpler and break a little bit more broken down, um, people usually do respond. And they do come back and say, oh, you know, I, I did drink uh, enough water the other day and I didn't have my headache. And it's like, huh. Yeah, it feels a little bit more doable. Exactly. So we try to make it a little bit more manageable, especially in the beginning phases of their treatment. Of course, there's always going to be those that are like, you know, just my back hurts. Can you just crack it and let me be on my way? <laughs> okay. So speaking of that, what's the most challenging part of your job or what do you hate the most about being a chiropractor? Maybe hate's a strong word, but like besides charting, what do you not like? <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Great question. I think I'm always a little bit wary when people come in and tell me that, you know, I, I always crack my neck first thing in the morning and I, and I cringe and I, I get a little bit scared for them because I think what people don't understand about the word crack or that noise is that just because you get the noise doesn't mean you did the adjustment. Um, that crack, in fact, is, is gas bubble built up in between your joints and when you mobilize a joint the bubble pops and that's the noise you hear that is the most satisfying noise ever I just it certainly can yes I, I I literally could just sit in your office and listen to you crack people all day <laughs> that will be an interesting uh day of observation but you are more than welcome to come to my office and shadow me for the day <laughs> That might be like a little creepy to some, <laughs> like, who's this, who's this chick in the corner that's like sighing every time you crack me? No minor. She's here to observe them. It's okay. Um, 
But, you know, I always tell people just because you heard the noise doesn't mean you move the right joints. And in fact, sometimes you could be moving the wrong joints, but you heard the noise and you think you fixed yourself. But really, you're just inducing more hypermobility and laxity into your joints and, and ligaments. So that long term effect can be detrimental, as you can imagine. Um, and then you're seeing them later for a different problem that could have been prevented. Exactly. Um, so that's probably a part of my job that I, I have to be very cautious about because people have their habits and it's hard to break them. And I understand, but it's also can potentially have a dangerous side effect if not done right. And my job as their chiropractor is to educate them on why is it that it's okay for me to do it, but not okay for them to do it. And especially teenagers. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> oh, oh, geez. Okay. So teenagers are naughty. I mean, I think we all knew that they're naughty. Okay. So do you obviously, well, maybe not obviously, do you adjust yourself? Not really. No. Okay. Okay. I have heard not to do that. Um, even if you know what you're doing, but um, another silly question. Do you see chiropractors represented in the media? Oh my gosh. Great question. We just binge watched Dead to Me. Have you seen that on Netflix? I have seen it. Yes, I love it. The second season. Have you seen the second season? I don't want to. Um, like... Of course I have. Of course I have. So, you know, one of the characters, is it the second season? The newest season, whatever that is. One of the char- main characters is a chiropractor. And in fact, they showed him, I think, doing adjustments on on one of the other characters. Again, I don't want to ruin the show for anyone. So that's why I'm speaking in very vague terms. Okay. So that was kind of fun to see in that, you know, chiropractors being represented in, in mainstream media. But like, was he doing it correctly? That's what I want to know. I was I was cringing a little bit because he was doing it like on a bed, which is a very soft surface, which is not ideal for adjustments. So okay. I, I was I was making comments at my husband and I think he probably just rolled his eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the media gets wrong when you're talked about or I mean, I've been on YouTube and I've watched videos of people just cracking other people. Mm -hmm. and like there's there's so much out there that so what do you think the media gets wrong I think it's that it's not just about the cracking um the adjustment themselves are very effective and again going back to the whole why you shouldn't adjust yourself is that when a doctor or chiropractic do it it's very specific um, it's not just to get the noise to get that satisfaction. It's to actually fix something. And when your spine is in alignment, your nervous system can communicate to the rest of your body in a really efficient manner. Um, and like I said before, we give our patients tons of homework to do at home to kind of complement the treatment that they receive in office. So what you see on YouTube is only, you know, a part of the treatment. And then there's this whole set of other treatment that is equally important, in my opinion, the stuff that you do at home, the things that you do to decrease inflammation. So absolutely. So um, I asked my Patreons if they had any questions for you. And they were like, I feel like I don't know enough about, you know, uh, like a few people were like, I'm not even sure what to ask. So um So just so you know, I think that there's a lot of like people that just don't understand your work and where you're coming from. But I think there's also like a lot of misconceptions out there. For example, can you speak to the old wives tale that says when you crack a joint, you are going to get arthritis? Mm. I believe there's been a few studies that's been published. Um, I can't think of the names on off the top of my head, but that. MDs have conducted where they, you know, on themselves, actually, he would crack his knuckles on the left hand constantly and then leave the right hand totally, uh, you know, without any sort of manipulation. I, again, I don't know how he's. Uh, exactly. Like this already sounds a little kooky. <laughs> but according to him, he didn't see any difference between the two. No better, no worse. Um, to the arthritis thing, I would just say that it probably could have some detrimental effect if you're doing this all day, every day. 
yourselves. But when you come to an office where there's doctors, we don't see you every single day. We probably, depending on your your condition, see you a couple times a week to start with. And then we cut that down to once a week. And then once every two weeks, once every three weeks, once a month. So the frequency decreases as your symptoms subside, of course. Um, and then most of our patients, as I've said, who opt to do the wellness program or our wellness care comes in maybe once a month, once every four to six weeks to just do kind of a, what we call a tune-up. Now, some people might be listening and might be like, chiropractic care is all woo-woo. Um, but I know that there is clinical research that supports chiropractic care. So where could listeners go to find more research and, and resources on the effects of good chiropractic care? Uh, many of us belong to the ACA, the American Chiropractic Chiropractic Association. They do a lot of research. That's a great resource for people who want to just learn chiropractic um, in general. Um, Minnesota also has a board of chiropractors. Um, it's an association as well where we also do research. I am personally part of the ICPA, which is the International Chiropractic Association for um, Pediatrics. Um, and there's tons of research on that as to the benefits of chiropractic, especially during pregnancy and pediatric population. Our, you know, and all those websites are listed everywhere, and it's obviously a great resource for anyone who... Excellent. So I'm going to have the listeners just take a break, and y'all just Google those things. And when we come back, Annie will share a story from her practice. So stay tuned. back with Dr. Annie Bayedo, our doctor of chiropractic care, and she's here to share a story from her practice. Take it away, Annie. Um, so as you can imagine, I see pain-related patients all day, every day. That's kind of the, the bread and butter of acute care chiropractic. So I, I have very similar stories. I'm kind of merging many stories into one, so to speak. But um, you know, someone comes in with pain after a couple of treatments, there's tears in their eyes when they're speaking to me about how much relief um, they've gotten from these visits and how big of a difference it has made in their lives. That's so special. I mean, there's just nothing else like it in the world. And I'm sure you can relate when, when a patient truly touches your soul and validates everything that you've been working towards. And, you know, this person in particular um, just does a, a lot for their family. Um, and because of the pain, they haven't been able to do so. And it's been weighing on them mentally, too. So, and because of their gut issues, you know, they're not able to take the medications that their MD provided. So that that's why they came to us um, to seek out chiropractic for their for pain relief. So once we kind of solve their immediate acute pain issues, then I was able to refer them out to a naturopath to kind of start addressing gut health. Um, and then after that, we sought out mental health professionals because we figured so out. So glad that you brought that into the totally into the, mix. The, the mental part is such a huge part of the physical symptoms, I think. And, you know, along the way, patients share a lot in the office with us um, from their childhood traumas to, you know, everything you can imagine. So we figured out that there was a piece of, of their past that they've been sort of closed off about and they need to kind of shed light on it and empower themselves um, to, to look at this head on and maybe this is part of why they're experiencing these physical symptoms in the gut and in the, in the neurological and the pain as well. So it's one of those success stories, so to speak, that when you speak of it, it gives you goosebumps because it, it keeps happening. It's not isolated. Um, and 
And that's what keeps me going. So people come to you and they they think they're just going to get adjusted and maybe a, a prescription for wellness and prevention. But really, you're looking at their whole body, mind, and spirit. And you're using your interdisciplinary team and other colleagues within the healthcare system to treat the patient as a whole person. You have just summed it up so beautifully. I think I should just sign off now and just say, <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Dr. Vanessa Casper. <laughs> I, I like how you really talked about mental health here because as you said before, pain can really wear someone down. I, I know people listening, anyone can relate to this. I think we've all experienced physical pain in our lives that has worn us down mentally. And then there's a whole... Um, a cycle of maybe not destruction, but a cycle of apathy that happens like, well, there's nothing else I can do. There's n- I, I'm giving up or I, I think that there's a cycle of apathy and I, it sounds like you guys treat the physical body. And then if there's something else that is needed that is out of your wheelhouse, you go to the next step and to another provider that can treat that. And um, I think it should almost always include a mental health provider. Um, in, in my opinion, everyone should go to therapy and every. <laughs> I mean, that's a blanket, that's a blanket statement, no, but, but I, right. I think that, but that puts a more positive spin or light on therapy versus traditionally speaking, when you hear someone's in therapy, you think something is quote unquote wrong as what we've been talking about is preventative. It's Um, getting ahead of things and it's very healthy to do absolutely Mm -hmm. so speaking of wellness what do you do in your life for self-care great question um as you know Vanessa I have a 15 month old he keeps me on my toes quite often as I'm sure your little one does too oh my god physical toll that is motherhood alone um, can certainly weigh me down as well as I need to be in really good um, physical condition in order to treat my patients as well. So my self-care consists of uh, a short 30-minute workout almost every other day, followed by a least a 20-minute, if not half an hour, Epsom salt soak. Oh, that sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, all the while my, this is during my son's second nap. I don't know what we're going to do when he doesn't nap anymore. I (laughs) will, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, I guess. Um, as well as, you know, Sunu wellness have, like I said, four other doctors. So we adjust each other, which is such a gift. Um, as well as acupuncture, um, acupuncture played a huge role in my life with fertility, um, specifically and anxiety personally speaking wow. so acupuncture is a, is a modality that I fall back on quite often and, and can I just ask like is is some of the chiropractic care that you receive and the acupuncture that you receive covered by your insurance well these are kind of in-house treatments that we trade on each other so we buy I see Okay, because I think some people listening might feel like, well, I don't have access to that. And so that it, it makes more sense about how you're going about getting these services. I'm very fortunate that I am able to get these services as often as I can. I do, I'm not sure about all insurance companies, but I do know some policies cover acupuncture. Yes, mine actually does. So that's, it's very interesting how I think for for the folks that are listening, if you've ever wanted to try an alternative method of care that isn't considered Western medicine or mainstream care here in America, um, look at your insurance because mine covers both chiropractic and acupuncture. And that never used to be the case, but I think insurance right. companies are realizing that if we keep people healthier, that that prevents other crap down the, down the line. Um, and so I, it's great that you have access to these. And I think people just don't know what their access is sometimes. So I encourage listeners to look at that. I, mind you, it's still a very privileged place that we're it coming is. from, Absolutely. that we have health insurance, that we have these resources. Absolutely. I just want to acknowledge that um, we're, we're very 
fortunate and and privileged to be in that space and to be having this conversation. And I just want to encourage people to look at your insurance and see if you could also benefit from something like that. So you do a lot for self-care. I I think that Mm -hmm. listeners could also, if do you have like an Epsom salt that you use that people can just go buy or do you have some kind of special concoction? Oh, no, I, um, you can get it from Target. I mean, anywhere, Amazon, anywhere. Okay. Okay. So just buy some Epsom salt, soak yourself in a bath. Exercise has been brought up on the pod before. Um, and it is then- so important to keep your body moving, especially during this time of lockdown, so to speak. Um, it's amazing for mental health, as we talked about, but also physical health. All right, Dr. Annie, where can people find you if they want to follow you or get more information on Sunu? How do they do that? Yes. So I am on Instagram as mama underscore adjusted. Um, You can find me on there. It's my personal blog where I kind of share a lot of pictures of my son. (laughs) But I do also talk about chiropractic and self-care and all the things, Um, as well as sunuwellness.com. That's our uh, official website. And you can and also- Sunu is S-U-N-U, correct? Yes, S-U-N-U wellness.com. And you can also find us on Instagram as Sunu Wellness. Beautiful. And listeners, you know how to find me. I'm at Dose of Support on Instagram, on Facebook, on my website, on Patreon, on all the things. It's Dose of Support. And you can submit your story. Um, By going to our website and clicking the SurveyMonkey link, we are happy to have any healthcare professionals on the show so that we can continue to share these stories. Thank you so much, Dr. Annie, for joining me today and sharing your role. I think it's really important. And to the listeners, I can't wait to talk to you again next week. Stories matter, and now we've captured another one. We'll be back next week with a brand new guest and a whole different story. Until then, make connections and give each other a dose of support. Dose of Support is written, produced, edited, everything by me, Vanessa Casper, with exclusive music by Rafael Sequeira. Don't forget to rate the show or leave feedback wherever you listen. I'm punching out until next week, where we try to find some self-care in healthcare once again. (laughs) 